All right, since I've got 175 slides, we better go ahead and get started. I saw some panic faces. No, there's not, there's not quite that many. There's about 160 slides. <laughs> All right, so anyways, uh, I definitely see a lot of familiar faces today. So thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I know that uh, this, this is between just, uh, just us, but I know that in John's infinite wisdom, he put two portraits uh, and lighting guys talking at the exact same time. So we had to kind of like shoot, you guys had to kind of choose. So I especially appreciate you for coming to uh, check out uh, what I have to say. So for those of you that have never met me, my name is Jeremy Smith and I am primarily a portrait photographer. So I also uh, work at Bedford Camera. So I do a lot of the classes and everything there. And uh, I do a lot of uh, commercial photography, a lot of portraits. And uh, honestly, I just like to play around a lot with a lot of different things. I was out shooting the baseball game a little bit last night, um, although, I don't know, it was either that or watch paint dry. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it wasn't quite that boring, um, but it was, it was, you know, it was okay. Um, I, I, was, I was okay. I actually almost got hit by a ball, so that made it very interesting. But um, the thing is, I think that, you know, as a photographer, it's good to go out and do different types of things. And that can really help you learn some new skills that we can apply to our main interest. So that was really, really good. Um, in addition to my portrait work, I like to do a little bit of video. I am, I am a YouTuber, so I do like to do a lot of like camera reviews and tutorials and things like that. And um, you know, I'm definitely kind of a, a takey guy. That's my, my background. You can probably tell by all this extra crap I brought in here. Um, so I'm kind, of, I'm, kind of a, I'm kind of a takey guy. And the thing is though, like in, in photography, we've got all the tech, but then we have the art as well, right? So we've got all these artistic elements. And so the, the whole process fascinates me a lot. Uh, for those of you that are kind of curious about uh, wanting to learn more about a certain camera, if you're kind of comparing different models or comparing a lens, I've probably, I've probably done some testing there. So if you check out my YouTube channel, I have a lot of information there. And you can find me on, on social media by my very, very modest name. I'm a really modest guy, you know? Uh, so yes. Uh, <laughs> Right, very, very modest, you know. Now it doesn't say Photog J the greatest, but <clears throat> if I can't say so myself, it does say Photog J the great. So anyways, <clears throat> and this is my website, jsmith-photography.com. And here is what it looks like on YouTube. I have a lot of different playlists on here. I kind of divide it into different categories. I've got playlists about, uh, you know, Canon cameras and Nikon cameras and Sony cameras and so on. Um, although I don't mix those up because, you know, not all the brands are equal. No, no, just kidding. Uh, mostly, mostly kidding. Okay, that, that was a joke. You don't have to, you don't have to like see me in the parking lot. I'm, if I, if I fin, you know, if I, if I mention your favorite, uh, you know, camera. I did always talk to Craig about Canon's insistence upon putting a micro HDMI port on all their cameras and, and other things, but uh, yeah. So, <laughs> among other things, right? But anyways, but yeah, I do a lot of different, uh, different reviews on different cameras, but the thing that inspires me the most about uh, photography, you know, I'm, I'm a really techy kind of guy. I grew up and I used to always like take apart computers. My mom would be like, Jeremy, you've got to get these computers out of my house. When I was in like fifth grade, every room, all over my room, everywhere, computer parts everywhere, all this, right? So I'm a kind of a techie kind of person, but the thing that's interesting to me about this is that with photography, we have everything going on with the camera. And I'm the type of guy that will probably later on go down to the trade show and give our Canon rep and our Sony rep a hard time and I'll start asking them about the element count of a certain lens and if their new lens coating is really better than the old one and all this sort of thing. But beyond all that in photography, we get into what I really think is the most interesting and that is our ability to create uh, a, a, a visual representation that has impact. And one of the biggest things that makes a difference in photos is lighting. You know, you may hear someone say, man, you know, you took a really awesome photograph. I love this photograph. Like, like what, you must have a really great camera. And uh, I'll tell them, oh yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it, you know? Um, your, your mouth makes really great compliments. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so you know you get into that, but really though, when people notice what's 
they notice something in an image and they say, man, this looks awesome. The thing that we notice the most is the subject and the lighting. So yes, there's all this nerdy stuff happening with the lens and the camera and all this, but really the light in the subject is what makes that photograph. So kind of keep that in mind. So this is why I'm so passionate about talking about lighting. Now, when we think about uh, creative portrait lighting, we have some different elements that we can use. And uh, by the way, the whole creative portrait lighting uh, title, uh, John came up with that one. I thought it was a bit cheesy, but I was like, okay, I couldn't come up with anything better. So he, he does a good job with that. So I was like, okay, cool, we'll, we'll go with that. But yeah, if we think about different things with lighting, we think about uh, some of the different creative uh, elements we can use. Probably the biggest thing that people ask me about lighting is, Jeremy, where do I put the light? People always want to know where they, they should put their light. You know, if you get a new lighting system, if you're, using a, if you're using a constant light, if you're using a speed light, if you're using a studio strobe, doesn't matter. A lot of times the big question is, okay, well, I've got this thing now, and here it is, and it can light up things, and, you know, I have no idea. I have no idea where, where should I put this, right? So in lighting, one of the biggest things to keep in mind is whenever we really talk about lighting, one of the main things we're talking about is how our shadows look. I mean, yes, we do look at how the specular highlights look and, and all these other things, but if we want to learn about lighting in a scene, the biggest thing you can look at is the shadows, right? So when we start talking about placing our lights, one of the biggest guides that we use to place light is to decide where we want our shadows to fall on our subject. Okay, is that, is that making sense so far? Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a different thing today. Um, I'm going to show you guys some of this in real time as well. Um, to be honest with you guys, I didn't think I was going to have a model to work with, and I actually have two models to work with. So I was like, oh, well, okay, I, I'm going to make this work somehow. So, uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but when we start thinking about where the shadows fall on, on a subject's face, we get into discussing something called lighting patterns, right? Now, has anyone ever heard this term? Anyone heard anything about lighting patterns before? Okay, some yes. So how many can think of a specific lighting pattern that you've heard of? Like, these lighting patterns have names, so I'm just kind of curious if anyone... Rembrandt. Yes, one of my favorites. Yeah, see, I paid Wendell to say that. You know, he knew. So he was going to mention my favorite lighting pattern right from the go. Uh, who, who else? What's that? Clamshell lighting. Yeah, so clamshell lighting, don't let me forget about that one, because that's got a specific name, too, that we'll talk about. Uh, can anyone think about another one? Side light? Side light. Broad light, okay. Hang on to that, too. Don't let me forget about that as well, because that gets us into something very specific, too. So, and I heard one more. Monster lighting, okay. Butterfly. Yes. Butterfly. Butterfly lighting, okay. Perfect. Okay, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know, the, the whole monster lighting thing is like, all right, guys, I'm going to tell you a story today. It's about a young man who is forced to continue to use DSLR cameras. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> kidding or not kidding? Okay. Um, yeah, so yes. Okay, so you guys kind of know what's going on with this. So yeah, so back during the pandemic time, I thought, wow, you know, I want to make I want to make some videos uh, that I've been meaning to make. So I was like, okay, I want to make some videos talking about different types of lighting. And uh, anyways, I did not have a model and I was at home and I was kind of bored. So, well, I did what any photographer would do. I got out some lights and I got my camera and I started, you know, playing with the lights. And this is what I came up with. And uh, yes, yes, yes. I looked, I looked, man, I got, my God, I look so sad in these pictures. Uh, it's, like, it's like I thought the chip shortage was going to go on forever and there would be no new mirrorless cameras to buy and that I really would be forced to keep using old DSLRs or something. Um, anyways, but yes, these are different lighting patterns. So we think about, we think about uh, butterfly lighting. Now, someone mentioned, some, someone mentioned clamshell lighting. So clamshell lighting is oftentimes what we might describe as, as butterfly lighting. So... Another term there. Um, now, this, uh, this lady over on this side mentioned uh, broad lighting. Now, broad lighting is, is it's something that you can still use any of these patterns, 
and have broad lighting, but broad lighting refers to something else. But it's like I knew you were coming because I have a slide that talks about broad lighting. So we're going to get there. But yeah, you have these different lighting patterns. Now, basically what's happening with lighting patterns, by the way, all that's really going on, I guess I should take my hat off for this. So all that's really going on is that you start off with the light in one position like this. So if you think about something like butterfly lighting, the light's going to start off right here. And as we start getting into these other lighting patterns, what's happening is the light is basically getting further and further off axis of the camera. So if you guys are the camera, you know, and, and you guys are taking a photograph of me, then if we keep taking this, if we take, keep taking this light and moving it further from the camera axis off to this side, we start to dip over into those other lighting patterns. If we start going back on axis with the camera, we're going to start getting back towards, towards a butterfly. So literally what's happening is the light's here and it's kind of going across just like this. So that's basically what's happening with our, with our lighting patterns. Okay, so making sense so far? Okay. All right, so yes, and I'm, I'm so sorry, ladies. See, this is the part, see, I, I, I was planning on like doing this thing too, but we have models to use. So I have another idea that when we talk about another lighting concept, We'll do, some, uh, we'll do some things with, uh, with our, our models. I'm thankful that they came to be able to help us out. And I don't have to like be the presenter and the model today. Although I was like totally mentally psyched up for it. And even dressed for it too, right? But anyways, it's okay. <laughs> so we go over here. If we think about something like butterfly lighting, butterfly lighting is typically going to have our light placed directly, uh, kind of like coming from overhead uh, over, our, over our subject. And we, we kind of have our light coming down at a 45 degree angle. Now, I'm not saying that you should always have your light coming down at a 45 degree angle, but this is just a good place to start. You know, if you start getting the light up here, you start to get less light in the eyes. Uh, you get less reflection, less catch light. So that makes the portrait take on a different type of look. You know, if I wanted to make someone look more mysterious or perhaps a bit sinister, I might actually have the light all the way up here because we're not getting that catch light in the eyes. Um, a lot of times you'll see a portrait of someone that's supposed to be warming and, warm and, warm and inviting and you don't have any catch light in their eyes. They don't look alive. You're like, man, well, I don't know if I trust this person. Like, you know, um, my friend uh, Gail was telling me about how she has been doing a lot of work uh, with lawyers and she's doing a lot of filming with them. So I don't know, maybe with some of those videos, you might actually have the light up here to where you don't have the catch light in the eyes, you know. Uh, Okay, that was, yes, I'm glad someone got that. Um, <laughs> anyways, I, I, I will not quit my day job. So yeah, if you want to have like, you know, generally speaking though, we want to have the light to where we can still get some catch light in their eyes. Because if it's up too high, you know, well, they're going to look like a lawyer. I don't know. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so if we look at butterfly lighting, Butterfly lighting is basically going to be characterized by having this sort of butterfly wing shaped shadow right below our subject's nose. So let's, let's take a closer look at this. Okay, so there you go. So you can kind of see what's happening here. So you can see how that shadow is forming there. So basically, you know, this, this gives us a little bit of a different type of, uh, type of look. Now, what would you say, what else might you say about this, about this photograph as far as lighting is concerned? What else do you notice? Reflection of glasses. glasses, okay. No backlighting. No back okay. So we've got a lot of, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, but I'm glad you're noticing these things. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the reflection of the glasses, Larry. So if you're photographing a subject with glasses, it can be a good thing to get the light a little bit higher. You can also tell a person, you know, lower your head, raise your head a bit because if you have the light too flat to the glasses, it's gonna be a situation where basically the light's gonna reflect back along the same path it came from. So if your camera is sitting here and the light is here and their glasses are right here, then that light that's reflecting off the glasses is gonna reflect right back into the camera lens. But if you have the opportunity to, um, you know, get that, to change that angle up a little bit, you know, get the head down this way or, uh, or raise the light a bit more, then the light's gonna reflect back in a different direction and not straight into the camera lens. Hello, Hi. welcome. Um, there's some space over, over there if you'd like to. You're not disturbing us. Hi. 
Okay, so that's where we are there. Now, if we continue to take our light and we continue to move it across, uh, across uh, our subject space, we're going to start to get into some of these other lighting uh, patterns. We're going to start to get into something like loop lighting as well. So if we think about loop lighting, we still have a shadow below the nose, uh, just like we did when we were speaking of the butterfly lighting. But now what's happening is our light source is not coming from straight on and down, it's basically shifted over to one side. So now that shadow that is below the subject's nose, it's starting to elongate in the opposite direction of the light. So can everyone see how that's working out? Okay. So basically, yeah, so basically we, we were here and we're kind of going over. So that shadow there is going across. So, you know, in the spirit of improvisation, uh, let's, let's just take a look at this. Okay, so whoever, yes. Now right now I'm not going to focus so much on taking photographs. I'm going to just kind of, I just literally want you guys to kind of see the light. You can see the light, but just don't walk into the light, okay? Ah, yes. <laughs> All right, let's see here. What have we got? All right, so you guys can kind of see what's happening here. Uh, now, if you're doing something like this, a lot of times whenever you're shooting, it's really, really hard to have your light where you want it to be and have it not get in your, in your way. Um, so a lot of times, using some type of boom on your stand can be really good. Because if you have the light just on the stand, then you're going to have a nice, lovely stand in your photograph. So they make these long arms and things like that that are great. But recently, Westcott started making this one that's actually pretty short. So that way you can kind of go in here <clears throat> and you have just enough of an offset to not have that problem, but then you don't have to carry around this big long uh, grip arm or anything. But if you guys notice here, we'll lower this just slightly. Yeah, so you can see we have what is basically butterfly lighting right here. So you guys can see how this shadow is forming right below Brandy's nose. Now, if I were to take this light and start moving it off to the side, you can see how right there, we're getting more into this loop lighting pattern. Because as we move this light off further to the side, that shadow is going to start to shift, and it's going to start to elongate. So that's exactly, that's exactly what we have going on here. Okay? Now, okay, if we think about some other things here, if we think about another lighting pattern, this is, this is Wendell's favorite that he, uh, he mentioned. If we think about uh, Rembrandt lighting, you guys will notice that I love Rembrandt lighting a lot because I actually have a lot of examples of this. But what happens with Rembrandt lighting is, we basically, it's basically just like the loop lighting pattern, except now we've got the light further off to the side to where that shadow is going to actually start to get even longer and then we're also going to start to uh, block a lot of the light reaching the opposite side of the face. So another shadow is going to form. And then both those shadows are going to kind of converge. And then we get this Rembrandt lighting pattern. And so Rembrandt lighting is going to be characterized <clears throat> by having this sort of like triangular patch of light here on the uh, opposite side of the subject's face. And then the rest is kind, of, is kind of obscured into shadow there. So if we take a look over at Brandy, I tell you what, Brandy, let's move you over just a little bit. Here we are, yeah, right about there, huh? Okay. I love when I put things right back into my way. Okay, so you guys can see. So there we had our butterfly lighting over here. But yeah, as we start to get off to the side, we start to get over into this Rembrandt lighting. So you can kind of see exactly what's happening there. So you can see how that shadow is starting to shift over. Okay, so making, making sense so far? Okay. 
So that's how that works out. Now, the other thing is too, whenever you're doing certain types of things with lighting and you wanna have a certain lighting pattern, it's very important to communicate to your subject because your subject may not know exactly what's going on. So a lot of times when people get to posing, you know, they, they, get, to, they get to posing like this and they wanna stand over this way and they wanna go like this. I'm gonna go like this, I'm gonna go like this, you know? Um, and so basically, if you're not careful, you might have your light right here and your subject might end up wanting to pose and they're like totally not facing the light. So it's very important to say, hey, Brandy, so we're going to be doing this thing here where we want to get just this side of your face accented by the lights and I kinda of wanna place more of this side of your face in shadow, but in order for us to do this, we've got to work together and I'm going to need you, you can still move, but I want you to stay positioned where you're facing this direction. And so that can make a huge, huge difference. So communicating with your subject about sort of that sort of thing makes a big, big uh, difference. Sometimes folks will say, Jeremy, I was taking a bunch of photos and they didn't all have the same look. And I'm like, okay, well, why didn't you just tell them what you were doing? You know, and say, hey, we're doing this and don't face opposite the lights. Face, hey, move, you can move around and pose, but keep facing the light, you know? So that communication can make a big difference. Cool, okay. All right, I, get, I think this is all for now. Okay, okay so this, just in case, but. Uh, okay, so making sense? Making sense so far? Okay. <clears throat> Alrighty, so, a few more examples of this. Man, look at that, Dre. Man, look at those handsome guys behind the scenes there. I'll tell you what. Man, they're, they're, they were going to be even more adventurous that day. They're actually going to wear uh, gray instead of all black. So a really high fashion look going on, for sure, no doubt. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can see how I have my, have my, how I have my light placed uh, to get that Rembrandt type of look. So essentially what's going to happen there is you don't have the light completely off to the side, but you basically don't have it straight on either. It's kind, of, it's kind of like coming down from a 45 and it's kind of off to a 45 degree angle. So you guys can kind of see how that's all positioned there. Okay, so same sort of thing going on. Um, I told you guys that I do love this type of effect. Now the environment that you're shooting in can make a difference. Uh, in this particular situation, I'm shooting and we're in this, uh, this, is, um, this is downtown uh, North Little Rock, this is in Argenta. And they've got this sort of like uh, very, very, what would you call this? Very, uh, it's like a corrugated type of wall and it's metal and all this. And so basically in this environment, there's a lot of shiny surfaces around there's a lot of white concrete around. So in, a, in an environment like this, that shadow is not quite as deep. You guys may notice as it's going to be in some of the other photographs because all those shiny surfaces are kind of reflecting the light and filling in. So if you don't want that type of effect, if you do want to have more shadow, then a lot of times having darker uh, materials around can make a difference. You could put a subtractive panel, basically just a black piece of fabric off to the side or a black piece of foam board to the side, and that would get you a much, much deeper shadow and it would prevent the light from bouncing back. So that's what happens in a situation like this. So the other thing is too, um, a lot of times, you know, subject interaction can, makes a big, can make a big difference. Uh, you know, Mark is definitely used to taking photographs and not being in front of the camera, but here, you know, he's pretty chill, he's pretty relaxed. You know, he doesn't have a big old grin on it, but he's, you could say that his eyes are smiling a bit. But sometimes I like to mess with my subjects a little bit. Of course, you guys can see how there's the same Rembrandt lighting pattern going on. And we have a black background and a black subtractive panel uh, to basically bring out those shadows a lot more. Now, I want you guys to watch his facial expression right here. Wow, it's pretty different right there, right? So sometimes, sometimes I like, find, and this is not lighting related, this is just kind of portrait related in general, but a lot of times I like to mess with my subjects, you know? Sometimes I'll go and I, I know that I want a specific look to the photographs with the subject, so my interaction with the subject is as such. So I might come in and say, oh, hey guys, how are you doing today? All right, so let's see about, let me just get this background set up, we're gonna get this shoot knocked out, it's gonna be really great. Uh, and uh, yeah, let me know if I can do anything. I might be just super, you know, like this. Uh, although after that, I usually have to go and take a full day's rest because I'm an introvert, but I sometimes do that, right? Um, but then another day, I might come in and say, all right, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get these shots taken. Um, I'd like you to just sit right over there for me, please. Okay, good. Okay, let me do this. And so a lot of times by my certain tone and my interaction, that can affect the subject. 
Uh, and then sometimes I just like to mess with people. So Mark, as you know, is a photographer. So the way that I got the change of expression from the first frame I showed you guys to this one, I was like, I was like, hey, you know what, Mark? He's like, he's like I was like, hey, you know, this one looks good. He's like, yeah, I like that shot of me. I'm like, let's take another one, you know? And then, you know, got the camera up and uh, <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, you know why I don't shoot Nikon? Because if I shot Nikon, I would basically just be using Sony components that are rebranded anyway. You know, if I want, if I want to get that type of effect, I can just, you know, I can just rather, I'd rather just get it directly from Sony, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, Nikon, they're, they're, old, they're old school, you know. They might be as old as you. Like, I mean, I literally just like started messing with them. And uh, again, don't hate me. I'm not trying to talk about your cameras. Um, but yeah, but I did that. And so like, so he's holding on to the Nikon like, nobody talks to us about Nikon like that, you know. So, so anyways, just, just some extra things to keep in mind. Yeah, I had, to, I had to break the news to him last night that uh, one of our Nikon reps is now a Sony rep. So anyways, I could have taken this photograph. I could have taken this photograph all over again, actually. <laughs> uh, anyways, but back to lighting patterns again. I do like to uh, ramble, but along an organized path, if you will. <laughs> That's how I, how I put it. <laughs> so anyways, if we look at our lighting patterns again, um, if we think about having the light directly off to the side, we get into this sort of split lighting pattern, something along these lines. And honestly, you know, the interesting, the interesting thing about this is, as a photographer, as we start placing our lights a certain way and doing things a certain way, we, we find ourselves kind of defaulting to, to certain things. Um, I, I don't use this lighting technique as much as I probably should. I think it can be interesting. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. When we think about things like uh, the Rembrandt lighting pattern, it's named because of Rembrandt, the old master painter, because he would paint his subjects by window light and so forth. And so, yeah, so it's, it's interesting how these different light, this different light can be kind of a photographer's signature, if you will. Okay, so we'll kind of go past this. All still making sense? Everybody good, okay? Yeah, and by the way, I kind of look at this as, as though we're all having a sort of a group discussion of sorts. So if you have questions or anything, I, I don't mind, you know? Okay, so let's see. So one other thing I'd want to talk about when it comes to lighting, this is going to be uh, to the pleasure of, tell me, tell me your name, ma'am. Jennifer. Jennifer, okay. Jennifer. Jennifer, she, she, she came over to my house last night and she snuck in and she looked at my laptop and she saw what was in my slideshow. Uh, it would seem. <laughs> it would seem. She might have a husband. I have to say it would seem. I don't want to, it's weird. Okay, I'm going to shut up talking now and go back to lighting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> broad, broad versus short lighting uh, is another topic that we might use, uh, or another term we might use. Now, broad versus short lighting is not really specifically a lighting pattern within itself. It's more of like where we want our shadows to fall. So we start thinking about you know, Rembrandt lighting and loop lighting and butterfly lighting and split lighting and all this, and that kind of dictates you know, this overall sort of shadow pattern, but we kind of have to make a choice. Do we want to have the shadow side of the subject's face uh, facing the camera, or do we want to have it facing away from the camera? And so that difference between the two is basically what we get into when we start talking about broad versus short lighting. So if we look at this example here, um, who knows which one of these is broad lighting and which one is short lighting? Broad on my left. Broad on my left, mm -hmm. right, correct. Yeah, so basically when we start thinking about uh, broad lighting, broad lighting is going to be characterized by having the um, light side of the subject face closest to the camera and the shadow side furthest from the camera. And then short lighting is going to be the opposite. Shorter lighting is going to put the shadow side of the face closer to the camera, the brighter side of the face further from the camera. Now this is kind of a personal sort of preference. Um, and it can also depend on your subject's face. If you have a subject that has a face that is uh, a bit more narrow and you want to make it a bit fuller in the frame, then that's where you would choose something like broad lighting. If you have someone with a fuller face and you kind of want it to have a slimmer profile, slimmer look, that's where you might choose short lighting. A lot of people will say, and I wasn't aware of this term, um, 
because I'm, 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 I guess I'm too young, but I found out about this term. They, they used to say, uh, portrait photographers used to say um, something to the effect, I don't even remember what, the, anyways, they basically said never light a lady with broad lighting, you know, because they, anyways. Um, actually, as I think about what the actual saying was, I realize that it's probably not appropriate for 2000. <laughs> Uh, 22. So that's why my brain kind of paused there for a second. Um, but anyways, um, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. Sorry, I have a bit of this. I have a bit of this stream of conscious thing going on in my head sometimes. But anyways, uh, really the truth is it kind of depends. I mean, it, not every situation is the same. Not every subject is the same. What type of photograph you're wanting to create can also make a, a big difference. One thing that's interesting is if you were photographing, say, fashion, and you wanted to also uh, show off your subject's clothes in addition to the actual subject, you might actually choose broad lighting because it actually does put more emphasis on the clothes and style and things like that. Uh, whereas short lighting makes for a more intimate feeling portrait. It doesn't put as much emphasis on uh, clothes and things of that nature. It puts more emphasis back on the face. So a lot of it can be a, sub a subjective type of thing. But if we were to take a closer look at this, we can basically see, uh, see a closer uh, difference here. So pretty interesting. I also have the same model in both shots because I think that's fascinating too, how it does transform the look of the subject quite a bit as well. And I, I, I get that the glasses are doing that a bit too, but yeah, the lighting itself can totally change the, the look uh, of a subject and it can totally change the feel of the portrait. Okay. Did she have glass in those lenses? Uh, very much to my dismay, yes. Yes, she did have glass. So I, I shot a lot of frames, and yeah, I tried to position her face as much as I could and position the light as much as I could, and I got, I got a lot of glare in most of these pictures, not gonna lie. And uh, yeah, this was one of the few ones where I did not have a lot of glare. So, yep, yeah, but there was glass there. Which is another good trick that a lot of people do as well with, with photographs. Sometimes they will remove the, the, gla the uh, glass from, from the frames and so on. So anyways, I'm too clumsy for that. I'd probably break someone's glasses. But um, <laughs> some photographers uh, do that. Okay, any other questions? Everybody good? Uh, yeah, so broad lighting. Broad lighting is going to have the, the face or the side of the face that's most lit up. That's going to be facing the camera. It's going to be closest to the camera. And then the, face, and then the side of the face with the shadows is going to be furthest from the camera. And then the short lighting is just the opposite. So the short lighting, we have that shadowed side of the face closest to the camera, and then the illuminated side of the face is going to be further, further from the camera. I guess I should come over on this side too. It's, it's nice over here. I can move. OK. OK, so another thing that we think about is light quality. Now, who knows what's meant by the term light quality? Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going along the right avenue, but soft versus hard. Soft, soft versus hard. That's right. Well, I guess I'm going to owe Kirk some money too. See, I paid him to say some things as well. No, he's kidding. <laughs> so yeah, so hard versus soft light. Basically, again, this is going to be about the shadows, um, but instead of being about where our shadows are placed, this is going to be about what the shadows look like. So, I've got some examples, of course, but let's, 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 do, let's do some demonstration. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to lull everyone to sleep with my, with my voice uh, if we don't like get up and move around and do something, so, okay, cool. Okay, so Amy. Amy, okay. I'm saying that out loud. I have to remember names. Okay. All right, so if we think about having a given light source, uh, now I'm going to back up a second. This can also, hard versus soft light can also be due to the environment, right? So if you're in a situation where you're shooting on a day that's, you know, it's, you've got no clouds, very clear day, you are going to see harder light in that type of, uh, type of situation because we have this large sun, but it's very far away. So relative to us, the sun is very, very uh, small. So it's gonna cast harder shadows. But if we're outside and it's a very, very overcast day, 
that overcast day is going to act like a soft box and it's going to basically soften out the look of our sun. Um, we, can do this, we can do this artificially as well too. So if I, I knew this was a bad idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay my phone down eventually and not be able to find it. You guys just can't laugh at me when I do. All right, so we, we have light that's more hard here. Now, basically we have harder light because we have a light source that's pretty small relative to our subject. If we were to take this light source and make it smaller, we could even make this light even harder if we wanted to, right? So maybe, let's see what we have here. Other types of artists get a chance to you know, do their shading difference in their uh, you know, charcoals and other uh, forms of art. But a photographer, well, we need extra things to make the things happen. It's kind of like being Batman or Iron Man. You have no actual superpowers, but you just have tech augmentations to make it happen. Okay, so oh, I'm glad you can appreciate that. See, it's, it's great, it's great. Some of you are like, what? Don't worry about it, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so if I were to take something like a, like a grid, for example, this is a grid that is a 10 degree grid. This is going to make the light source even basically have less spread. It's going to make the light source more concentrated, smaller. So we could take this. We could put this onto our light and we could get the light just in one spot and we could actually start to get some harder, harder light here. So you guys can kind of see how that works out. Or if I wanted to make for a more soft look to our light, we could use something like a soft box or an umbrella. Now, honestly, I could talk about, I could talk for an hour about soft boxes, but um, I think I only have like only two more left. I could, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm gonna just <laughs> make this kind of quick. Okay, so now if we take this, this is basically akin to taking our, 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 to being outside and having that cloudy day appear all of a sudden, right? So now we're basically taking this light source and we're making it larger. So now you'll notice that we still have shadows on our subject's face, but hard light versus soft light has to do with what those shadows look like. If you have softer light, those shadows are going to be more diffuse um, or, or softer. If we have hard light, the shadows are going to have a more defined outline, a more defined edge, right? So that's going to be our difference between the two. Now, when we start thinking about this, distance plays a part as well. If I had to basically back this light up to get more spread, the light would also get harder because this light source is going to be smaller relative to our subject. So if I back this light up further to get a lot of spread, like if I put this back on again, Well, Dre, one time when I'm a really, one day when I'm a really big time photographer, I'll have like five people like do all this for me and I just talk. But uh, until then, so you can see how like right now, the light spread is pretty narrow. It's just going from face to about, about, uh, about waist level here, right? Well, I could back the light up and get more spread out of it. But if I do that, the light is going to get, it is going to get a bit harder because now that light source is going to be smaller relative to our subject. So at that point, what would I do? If I wanted to get more spread but still keep the lights off, what, what would I do? Anyone? What, what am I to do? Put a larger soft box. Put a larger soft box on it. That's right. Yep. And that's why we have, have to have a big case of everything. Yes, I'd have to put a bigger soft box on. So that way I could have this larger light source. I could still have it further back to get the spread. But if I had a four foot soft box on here instead of a two foot soft box, I'd be able to maintain that softness and still get us the spread we want. So that's how that would work out. But yeah, with soft boxes and stuff, usually it's a balance between like finding something that's going to give us the soft light we want and like not crashing into someone's ceiling fan. Because <laughs> I, I like to do a lot of on location work, so I might go to someone's home. So I'm always trying to find a nice in between. That's why oftentimes we'll use a three foot soft box because it's big enough to get me some spread and soft light when I back it up a bit but it's not ungangly if I'm trying to move it around and you know, things like that, so. Okay, cool, cool. 
Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so let's see. We'll mosey over here again. All right, so if we think about hard versus soft, these are just some examples of what I just kind of showed off there. I'm not going to dwell on this too long because I think you guys are starting to get how this all works. But yeah, if we take a look at our shadows here, you can see everything is really, really, uh, I mean, all the shadow edges are very defined. I'll back up a second and, and mention this too. Sometimes when people are shooting fashion and stuff, they might go with the harder light because harder light makes the clothes look better. You know, you get more detail in the fabrics and things like that. So that may be a time when you may do that. I mean, you're probably not going to go and, and take a photograph of, uh, of someone's grandmother, you know, <laughs> with this type of lighting style, you know, so keep that in mind, right? Unless she's really edgy, which she might be, so, but usually you probably would. <laughs> yeah, so some different examples uh, here. Now, a lot of times, if you are shooting outside and the background is really, really bright, it can be difficult to get the subject illuminated and, the back, and balanced to the background if you're trying to do so with soft light. Because a lot of times, well not a lot of times, but anytime you put a soft box in front of a light or an umbrella in front of a light, uh, you're going to reduce the light output. So unfortunately, this is how sometimes we end up with larger, more powerful flashes if we're trying to be able to get like uh, softer light uh, and still be able to overpower the available light. In this situation, this is just a bare flash. So basically the sun was very bright, so I had to just use that bare flash to get this effect, but it kind of works out here. And again, if we look at the shadows, Basically, nearly everything you want to know about the light in the scene can be told to you with the shadows. Usually if I end up going to like the mall or something like that, and I'm just sitting there and I'm waiting for, um, you know, for my mom or my girlfriend to get done with choosing cosmetics. Uh, anyways, I usually find myself looking at, the, looking at the different posters that they have, you know, and I, I, I just stand there and I'm like, I wonder how they lit this and I'm like looking at it you know and they leave and come back 30 minutes later and I'm still like standing there looking at some photos and anyways <laughs> yeah so another thing that's interesting too uh, is that and this is not a lighting thing this is just another side note but yeah if you're taking different photographs exploring different angles is not a bad thing this is this is how I oftentimes end up yeah, if I don't have to come home and like, you know, wash my clothes, then I probably was too lazy at my shoot. Someone said that uh, nothing interesting in photography happens at eye level. Anyway, so if you are on a day that's very, very cloudy outside, a lot of times a cloudy day can be a very good day to take portraits. The light's very soft. It's not like the mid harsh midday sun. However, a lot of times, under those conditions, the light can lack a little bit of character. It can be a little bland, a little boring. You know, it doesn't have any direction to it. So this might be why we still, uh, we may still choose to augment our available light with some type of other light source. So I think you guys get the whole soft versus hard thing. I'm going to skip past this a bit and I'll show you this one. So you can see this is what this scene looks like with no lighting added at all. So it's not like we're trying to light up our subject, but we just want to establish some direction because we've got this big, soft, sort of omnidirectional light source that's lacking in character. But if we have a light source placed off to the side, we can give some direction. We can add some life to the subject's eyes. So I spoke about that earlier. On a, on a very cloudy day, you're not going to have very much light in the subject's eyes, especially if they have deep set eyes uh, like Cody does here. But if we have a light source here, we can establish some direction to our light. We can give things a bit more interest, and it makes a huge difference. Okay, let's see. I've got 100 slides left. No, just kidding. Uh, so I've been <laughs> we'll keep going. But yeah, you can see our light is placed here. Here I am using a bigger softbox. I'm using a four-foot softbox here. 
So that way, if I want to back this light up and get some full body shots of, Coda, of uh, Cody, I can still get those types of shots and still have very soft light. All right, so I think, yeah, I think we're getting the idea of this. So same type of thing. This is also on a cloudy day. And again, I'm just using just enough light to give our light some direction. I like to take as many behind the scenes shots as possible. All right, so we'll, we'll keep this party going. Yeah, so same type of thing. Okay, so this is the big one I wanna to get to. So if we start thinking about uh, some other things about our light, another thing that we speak about a lot of times is contrast. Now, the reason I, I was kind of thinking about this presentation and I was thinking about questions I've heard from people over the years, and I got to thinking, you know, I think people are really confused about the difference between hard light versus soft light uh, and contrast. You know, I, th I think that people need some, you know, some, some sort of like uh, di differentiation between those. So that's why I decided to do this. So if we think about, uh, if we think about contrast, a lot of times people will say, well, this photo, they may see a photograph with very well-defined shadows, and they may say, well, this has a higher amount of contrast. And, you know, honestly, sometimes that might be true, but a lot of times it might not be. Just because you have very well-defined shadows doesn't necessarily mean, mean that you have higher contrast. You can have high contrast and soft shadows or hard shadows, uh, depending on what you prefer. So if you think about contrast, this is a little bit better example. Now, guys, I'm sorry. I know that this is not the. Uh, I know that this is not an example that shows extremely high contrast, but I think that we can agree that there's a bit of a difference in contrast between these two shots. So, what do you think? Which one would you say is higher contrast? Which one would you say is lower? Left lower. Yeah. So left lower contrast, right side higher contrast. Right. Okay. Yeah, every time I'm putting together a presentation, I'm like, oh, I think I should take some more example photos. Anyways, I would have probably been doing that up until an hour before this if I kept on doing this, because it never ends once you start thinking. Uh, but let's take a look at this in sort of real time here. All right, let's see. Okay, so let's see. Let's take a, let's take a look. All righty. Okay, Brandy. So contrast can be determined by a couple different things. Um, if you're dealing with a single light source, you can have higher contrast just due to the light being closer to your subject. So if I take the light, now we know that this is relatively soft light here, but if I take our light and we move it closer to our subject, okay, if, as we get closer, we are going to have softer and softer light. We're going to see shadows that are less defined. They're going to have more feathered edges, right? But we also will see the contrast increase as well because now a lot of the light is just going to be centered on the side where the light is and not as much light is going to reach the opposite side. That's going to affect our contrast. So whenever you are positioning your light, remember that it's, it's kind of a balancing act between contrast and hard versus soft. A lot of, I think most people realize that as you move the light further away, you do get harder light. And as you move it closer, you get softer light but I don't think that people realize that there's a change in contrast as well. So a lot of times you have to balance out getting really, really soft light or really hard light with the desired amount of contrast too. Okay, does that make sense? So the first thing you can do to kind of control contrast is you can simply move the light. I mean, you can move it further or closer and you can see as I back up, the contrast drops a bit. If I go close, the contrast is gonna increase, but the other way that we can control contrast is also just by simply adding another light. Now, because of space limitations, I'm not going to do that here, um, but I have some examples I can show you. Okay, thank you. All right, so. Okay, so if we look at this photograph, we kind of know what's happening here. So what's happening with this photograph is there was a light that was very close to our subject's face. And just like we saw with Randy there, with that light very close to our subject's face, we see that contrast increase. We see this side of the face become more shadowed. 
On this photograph, the light is in the same position. The main light is in the same position, but now we've added another light to be our fill light. And basically I'm doing this fill light as if it were outside. So if we're shooting outside with flash, we basically have two light sources already because we have the available light in the scene too. But to kind of get that sort of effect indoors, I'm taking a very large uh, diffuser and I'm, I'm putting a flash through it to give us kind of like a cloudy day effect for, for our fill light. So you can kind of see that here. Now in the photograph that I just showed you, this main light was not in this position. The main light was positioned closer to the subject. But you can see how this fill is working over here. So you can see we have a very large umbrella and it's shining straight through this diffuser and that's giving us a better effect. So yeah, so Westcott, uh, they have this thing called a, uh, called a uh, scrim gem that you can set up and do this. Uh, this is not one of those. This is actually a king size bed sheet from Walmart. Um, but uh, it, it will do the same thing. <laughs> it does the same thing, yes. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's, how, that's another way we can change that contrast is by adding another light source. All right, so let's see. I'm going to get to move in here. Okay, so is that all making sense before I jump into the next thing? Okay, so another thing that we have to think about is the color of light. So a lot of times, you know, people, especially when we start talking about using any type of artificial light outside, people will say, well, there's plenty of light out here already. Why would we do this? Well, you know, we've already talked about direction. We've talked about quality. The available light may not be the direction or the quality we want. But guess what? It may not also be the right color either. So when we start speaking about color, we get into color temperature. Now, I, in, in, in order for me to not get so super technical, I had another slide in here that showed like a color temperature scale and the Kelvin scale and all this. And um, honestly, I'm not going to get into that right now. Really, the main thing you should know here is that, you know, you have, you have light that is cooler and you have light that is warmer. You've got light that's more blue or more yellow, basically. So if you think about uh, something like a cloudy day, a cloudy day is going to be more cool in color. The light's going to be more blue. If you think about putting your subject in the shade, the shade is going to be more blue. Um, so those are going to be some, some times when you'd see cooler colors. If you think about candlelight, or if you think about sunsets, or if you think about the incandescent bulbs that I so very love in this room. No, I do not love these bulbs. Uh, if you think about those types of things, that's going to be a warmer color of light. So that's how that works out. Now, if we want to modify how our camera sees these different colors of light, what, what might we do? What setting might we change? Who said that? I heard a little voice. White balance. White balance, yes. White balance. So white balance is the setting that we would change to affect this. Uh, your cameras do have an auto white balance setting, and it works out pretty well. I mean, the, the auto white balance on modern day cameras is actually really good compared to what it used to be in the past. It works out well, but there are times when we may want to take control over white balance, and we may actually, you know, we may actually want to uh, have a different look. And I'm going to talk about that, of course. And sometimes it may be a situation where the light is very unpredictable. Like, for example, the light that's in this room. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. You know, we've got some warm light here. We've got, the, uh, we've got a little bit of daylight coming in. Uh, that's why the camera that's filming me right now is not on auto white balance. It's on a preset value. So that way it's just going to stay the same. So if I move over there, over here, it's going to stay the same the entire time. So white balance is that setting. Now, if we think about our light, Okay, how are we doing? All right. Okay, so let's see. Let's take a look at something. All righty. Now, this light right here is a flash. It actually is a strobe, so it does have a uh, flash as well, so you can actually will flash like this. But on any type of studio strobe, a studio strobe is set up to where a lot of times it's going to have a modeling light. And the modeling light is especially important if you're going to photograph models. No, 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 no. Um, the modeling light is very important if you want to see what your light's going to look like beforehand. Because if you don't have the modeling light turned on and you get your light all adjusted and then, you know, you make it flash, then you just have to look at the camera and see how the light was. And then you have to adjust it and then take another photo and do this. 
Well, if you have the modeling light, you can turn that on and you can kind of see where your light's going to fall. And what's actually happening is when you take a photograph, that constant light source goes away for a moment and then the flash flashes and that's how you end up with your, with your image. Now on this particular light, I can actually change the color temperature of the light. So you can see we have warmer light like this, okay? And then we have cooler light on this side, right? Now, if we think about something like a sunset or candlelight, you know, or incandescent bulbs, this is going to be this side of the spectrum. In terms of that whole Kelvin scale uh, stuff, basically, the lower Kelvin values, like around 3000, that's going to be like more yellow light. And then daylight is around 5600. And then like very, very, you know, blue shade and stuff is around in the seven to 8000 range and higher. So that's what happens there. So if we were in a situation where we were going to photograph someone at sunset, we would want to oftentimes match the color of our flash to the color of the light in the environment. Now, if we're using an available light source, like an LED light source like this that we can change the, change the color on, you could do that. If you're using flash, there are different gels. Let's see here. Oh, yes, if I had five assistants, me saying the word gels would have been the cue to get the gels. But uh, anyways, <laughs> so you can see like right here, this is an example of a gel. So this is a warming gel that you might put on your flash to get us that warmer color. And if we were going to shoot and say it's, you know, more shade or if it's something like, uh, say it's something, something like a uh, very, very overcast day, we might use a blue gel to kind of make the flash just a little bit cooler. So it would be something like, something like this right here. So that's how we would actually do that. So as you look at the next photographs, put that there. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, so as we go to these next photographs, I'll show you. Now, if we think about our camera's interpretation of white balance, this is what actually happens with our white balance. Let's say that we have a situation where our light is neutral in color, just like it is right now. It's around daylight temperature. If we go in and we start to change our white balance setting, the camera is going to add more blue or it's going to add more yellow to kind of compensate for the presence of the light in the scene. So basically, if you have a scene like this, by the way, this, this scene is photographed with the light that's day, daylight color. So it was the color of that light over there. But I use different white balance settings. Uh, this is on the auto setting, so the camera's gonna basically adjust and get it neutral. Over on this side, this is on the cloudy white balance setting. So if you like, you know, if you guys are not as cool as me, and you like really, really warm colors, um, you can set your camera to cloudy white balance, and it'll add a little bit more yellow. And under a, under a light source that's neutral, this is the type of look that you will get. Okay, I see a hand. Oh, just blocking light. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay, is that better? Sorry about that. Okay, cool. Hey, yay for technology. Okay. Um, so that's basically what happens with something like this. Now, there are other white balance settings on your camera. Um, how many of you have played with any of those other settings? I'm just curious. Which other settings? Any, any white balance settings. Any ones other than auto. Okay, which one, which one do you like to use? Okay, cool. So you're not as cool as me. Okay, cool. Alrighty. Uh, who, who else likes to use any of the other settings? Well, I use Kelvin. So. Use Kelvin. Okay. Yeah. So like I say, if you want to have everything very, very consistent, you can set the camera to the Kelvin, uh, Kelvin temperature setting. Like for example, the camera back there is uh, set to Kelvin. I think we set it around 3000-ish something. So that way it would stay the same. So we can do that too. Does anyone use a uh, custom white balance by any chance? Okay, anyone? Okay, a little bit. Alrighty. So let's see. So there are some custom white balance settings that you can use too. There are different color checker charts that you can use as well. And basically, if, you, if you're photographing something that has to be a certain color, there are charts that you can shoot that actually will allow you to have consistent color. And if you're shooting in RAW, you can go back and read that that um, different pattern on the chart and fine tune your, your temperature. Let's see here. Let me. I know our time is running short, but if I don't show you, 
I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to be thinking about it. I'll be lying there in bed at night. Why didn't I just show them the chart? Uh, yeah, so there are charts like this. So a lot, of, a lot of these, like this one has some different patches on there for white balance. So if you shoot in RAW, you can actually go into your um, RAW editor and you can import a picture of this and you can actually go in here and select these different settings and by, by controlled increments, you can go warmer or cooler with your eyedropper tool. So this is a very, very useful tool. Now, when we start talking about using gels on flashes and all that, um, I have a very, very, uh, tough, very, very tough news to break to you. Shooting in RAW doesn't help with that. Um, you can go in there and you can mask and all this, but your camera and your software can't compensate for more than one color of light. So if you have light in the scene that's very yellow and it's very, very cool and you're trying to put them together, no, no amount of software adjustment is really going to, to be able to easily, easily alleviate that problem. So keep that in mind. So this is why it's important to start speaking about gels. Now, of course, if you think about something like the incandescent setting on your camera under um, under, say, daylight light, it's going to add a lot more blue. You're going to get an effect that looks like this. Some of you guys have probably inadvertently done this before. But uh, yeah, we're going to come back to that. There's actually a reason for this. Now, the other thing I'll mention, too, is that if you're under fluorescent lights, fluorescent lights do oftentimes have a certain tint to them. They may be very, very green. They may be very, very magenta. Uh, if you're in a situation uh, there, if you can eliminate those light sources, that can be a good thing. So if you go into a room and you've got daylight coming in and then you've got like, you know, fluorescent lights that are five colors, your camera is not going to be able to adjust for that. So if you can eliminate that light source, that can be a good thing. Uh, sometimes by using flash, we can eliminate the, the uh, very difficult light sources because the camera can be set to basically be, uh, basically, basically can be, it can be set to underexpose all the uh, odd colored light in the scene, but then we can add light that's the color we want through the use of our flash. So that's a good way to solve that type of problem. And yeah, if we go back to these two photos here, these photos were taken with flash, but I did use gels whenever I shot these images. So on an image like this, knowing that a cloudy day is much more blue, than our more neutral flash, I chose to use this blue gel to make the flash match that cool color in the environment a bit better. And then I did the opposite over here. Here, I used a warming gel on the flash, so that way the flash is also the same color as the sunlight. So that way we don't get that effect of where, you know, a lot of times we'll get an effect where we take the photograph and the flash stands out like a sore thumb. It looks very white and very neutral, but then you've got all this warm light around. This eliminates that problem. And again, that's not something you can easily fix in post-processing. So that's why I speak about this so much. I mean, unless you just have time to throw away by, you know, going into the Lightroom and masking and painting and when you could take two seconds to put the, the gel in the flesh. The choice is yours. <laughs> okay, so the other thing about white balance is, and color, a lot of times I don't think that people realize that white balance is something that can be used for artistic purposes. So earlier we saw a slide where I purposely shot the image with the wrong white balance and basically we had a daylight colored lights but I shot it on the warm incandescent white balance mode and we got very blue light. Well sometimes it can be interesting to do this on purpose. So in this particular situation what I've done here is I have set the camera to uh, incandescent white balance mode but the flash that's on our subject has a warming gel on it. So basically everything that the flash is hitting has the proper color, but everything that is being hit by daylight has a color that's not right, and it takes on that more blue tint. Uh, we were inside of a, are, wait, are there any like police officers or anything in here? Okay. Um, well, well we, were, we were inside of this boxcar uh, whenever we took this picture. Um, I've got this friend of mine who's like really big. He's like six foot six. So we, we saw this box car open. And so he, he was, I was like, man, you know, it looks kind of cool in here. Maybe we could take a picture. And I was just kind of like thinking out loud. But when I quickly turned back and looked back around, the model was in the box car. And so, I mean, he just basically picked her up like a child and just went like this and just set her in the box car. And he's like, yeah, Jeremy, that's the shot right there. And I was like, 
all right, well, here we go, <laughs> you know? Um, anyways, <laughs> so yeah, this boxcar had all these like sort of skylights in it. And all the skylights, you know, were, you know, of course, daylight, light colored. And then we had the flash with the gel on there. So basically all the light that's in the environment in the background has that very blue cast. And you guys will kind of notice that as you look down the photograph here, at the bottom, the light is even more blue because that's the areas where that very yellow gelled flash is not reaching. So it's kind of interesting to play with. So it's something that I do sometimes. Uh, I kind of did it again here. Here I was using a, a grid on the flash as well. So that way I was able to really narrow the light beam, just like I had the, uh, the grid on the flash a moment ago. So I was able to keep the light just up there. And then of course, we're still using the same gel technique. But that transition from daylight to flash is a lot more stark due to the, uh, due to the uh, grid being used. So we get this type of thing going on here. And Cammie is also wearing yellow pants. So for those of you that know something about color theory, yellow and blue, of course, are complementary colors. So it all really, really, really pops together. Okay, and let's see here. And then over here we have me doing the same thing, but here I just wanted the sky to look more blue. So it's really, really subtle here. Um, basically, you know, during the, uh, just after golden hour, once we get into that blue hour, I wanted to enhance that more. So basically, I'm using the same technique. The camera's on incandescent white balance mode, and we're starting to get a lot of that very, very blue color out of the sky being added because the camera is adding more blue. And the subject, is not, the subject is not very blue because she has yellow light hitting her. So it all kind of balances out. All righty. So yeah, the other thing is too, you know, you can of course use a lot of different gels. You don't necessarily have to stick to the whole warmer and cooler thing. I mean, you can just randomly throw a blue or a green gel in there. Uh, if your subject has green hair, then yeah, let's put a green gel on the background. Um, and a lot of times I'll use those different gel colors to kind of tie together the colors that are already there in the scene. Um, if you're using gels, keep in mind that they're going to show up more in the darker parts of the scene. So on this side right here, we have our main light coming from this side. The shadow side is over here. So the light with the gel on it is over here on the shadow side. Over here, the main light's on the subject. She's a distance from the background. The background is not receiving nearly as much light, so it's falling to dark. So there is a gel, uh, a gel flash firing up at the wall on this black, uh, I don't even remember if it was black or not. That picture was a long time ago. But anyways, whatever color the background was, it's not that color anymore because there's a green, a green gel flash hitting it. So that's how that works out. Yeah, so this is something I like to do a lot, you know? A lot of times I find myself, uh, a lot of times I find myself just experimenting with colors. I have to have a moment of silence for Sam's dress. Dre knows what I'm talking about. She was wearing another dress beforehand and it ended up, uh, she ended up accidentally, uh, or before the shoot, she was going to wear another dress, but she was ironing it before the shoot and she actually burned a hole in it. So uh, I had to, uh, yeah, you know, if you have your iron set to the cotton setting uh, and this type of fabric, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, anyways. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, but here we're using, we're using a second flash that has a gel that's kind of aimed more towards the shadows. So we kind of get this duotone type of effect. So we just have like this sort of pink color coming into the shadows. Um, apparently, one of the main goals for her was to show off these shoes because she uh, got sent them uh, by a company and so on. Don't worry, Dre, we've got like only 15, 25 more slides. No, just kidding. We don't have that much left. I want to leave us some time for questions. Yeah, so I do use gels quite a lot, as you guys can tell. Now, the other thing about this is too, you can even create the look of natural light. Uh, with artificial light sources. And you can do this in many different ways. Now, in this photograph right here, this is more of a surrealistic type of thing. It's not meant to be reality. Uh, someone came up to me and they were like, hey, well, you know, the, the, the real sun wouldn't be casting hard shadows like this. And I was like, well, you know, this isn't really reality. This is more of a surrealistic type of, type of thing. So a little bit different look. Now, the other thing I'll point out to you guys is that 
image processing still plays a part in this too. If we go back to the final shot, and then we go to the shot that just has adjustments in Lightroom where I adjusted the color, but no Photoshop, you guys can see that there's a lot of stuff here to give me away. The sun doesn't have a, you know, I don't, I don't think the sun is on a, on a stand. Um, and uh, yeah, so then we've got all these other distracting elements. I didn't want this image to scream River Market Parking Deck, I just wanted it to be like in a cool location and not have all these, these uh, identifying markers. So if we think about the image with Photoshop and Lightroom work done to it, okay, let's see here. Oh, yes, so that's like with everything done. This is just Lightroom only for color. And then straight out of the camera, it looks like this. And you guys can see just how bad I am at keeping the camera level and that I hate using tripods. But uh, anyways... But yeah, that's what it looks like with absolutely nothing applied. Now, notice though the basis of the lighting is still there. But yeah, image processing can certainly make a difference as well. But the more you can get right in camera, the better off it is. Okay, I know it's officially that time, but we're going to just take a couple more month, moments here. So I took these senior photos on a day when... I was tasked to, you know, she, she had all these Pinterest boards that showed all this nice beautiful available light, beautiful sunset. Well, we had a cloudy day. So here, it looks like there's sun coming through. That's actually a flash. This over here, that looks like sun coming through is also a flash. And that flash had a warming gel on it to give it that warm color. Because remember, flash is actually kind of neutral, but we wanted it to look warm. So I'm going to skip through these a little bit. So that's a little behind the scenes for you. We'll skip faster. This shows what it really looked like that day. Yeah, by the way, it was cold too. So yeah, this is what it really looked like in the scene. This is just with one flash on her here uh, and none of the flash in the background. But yeah, then I was like, okay, take off the jacket. You know, and then, then we can create this illusion. <laughs> Here's another example that shows you what's happening there. So that's what it looked like. This is what it looked like with absolutely nothing. And so you can see, we can really, we can really, really, uh, we can create our own light. We can create the look that we're going for. Like, yeah, no need to reschedule. I know you want this done. Look, don't worry, I got you, you know? And yeah, if you've ever tried to photograph anything like snow, a lot of times it can be really hard to kind of showcase that. But by using some backlighting techniques, we can really bring out the snow and get us that type of effect. Because yeah, a lot of times snow doesn't even show up very well. But here we can get that effect more. Ah, Jeremy, some final thoughts. Yeah, you should have made these a long time ago. Um, some of these I've already said. Uh, the camera matters, but it doesn't matter. You know, we can go through all these different technical things about the cameras. But honestly, guys, whenever I start, you know, I'm, I may spend this time you know, giving all of our reps a hard time and asking them all these picky questions about all the cameras. But whenever I'm taking photographs, I just want the camera to get out of my way and just let me shoot, you know? I just need to focus on the creativity. Uh, creativity. And so all these things about the cameras, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, some of these images were taken with DSLR cameras, mirrorless cameras. One of these was taken with an iPhone. Um, that is not the main thing. So the camera matters, but it doesn't matter. We think about the lenses uh, that we use. Uh, we think about having a wider aperture lens. You know, we always want those, those 1.2s and so on. Um, if you're shooting in a studio type environment and you control the light, and you're not trying to blur out a background, if you're shooting at f10 or f11, nearly any modern day lens, kit lens or not, it's gonna still give you a solid and sharp image there. So if you can control, in control the light, then that's not going to matter nearly as much. Um, although I will say that the lens is generally, in most cases, more important than the camera. Now, if you're shooting outdoors, you might want that wider aperture to help you blur the background and everything. But it's not, it's not the end of the world. I mean, light is still more important. So if you don't have that awesome 1.2 lens, although I would not object to you buying one. We do have some for sale downstairs. Um, you know. Uh, tax free, that's right. Yeah, anyways. So yeah, there, there is that thing. But if you don't have those, I mean, again, the light is what's going to matter a lot more. And of course, my favorite thing to mention before you depart 
is the fact that the sun is a light source as well. And the time of day that you choose is going to make a very, very big difference. Shooting earlier in the morning, uh, or if you just love to hug your pillow like I do, then later in the evening, you know, that's going to be a better time, not the middle of the day. So late in the evening or early in the morning, the sun is going to be much lower. We can get much more dramatic, a much more dramatic look out of our light. Right here, it looks like I use some artificial light, but this is actually just the sun. That evening sun was coming in at just the right angle to give us this perfect Rembrandt light here. And here the sun is being used as a source to backlight. So we have our main light, but the light coming around our model's shoulders is basically coming from the sun. So that's what happens there. Um, again, me being a nerd, this company doesn't pay me or anything like that, but me being a nerd, I do like to use this app called Sun Surveyor. And uh, that app is really cool because it allows you to track the path of the sun. So that way you know exactly where the sun's going to be and you can really know where to position your subject and you can really get some good, good effects. So that's how that all works out. I'll give you guys a little reminder uh, again of my little modest, uh, my very, very modest uh, social handle, social media <laughs> handle as well. Uh, and my website, but uh, yeah, do any of you guys have any questions? Any, any questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> any questions? Okay, well, I guess I'll put everybody to sleep. Okay, all right, thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>